is the most um, muddled, muddled, and inconclusive of my efforts. You may challenge that from other <laughs> examples, but it seems to me that the most uh, difficult, anyway. Um, but it has it has the benefit of probably being the shortest, which is a, I, I will prove a blessing to us all. I think, especially me. Um, but but the good news, I think, is that uh, I will I hope to lead you in this third from the end. There are two more after this. I I hope to lead you from this muddled present into into what Winston Churchill called the broad sunlit uplands, <laughs> which, which may also be an irony when you hear it the last two times, but it certainly will be a clearer account than what I can give you, give you today of what is, in my opinion, uh, the most difficult phase of, of our work, which I'm going to try to illustrate for you. I may illustrate more better the muddlement than the clarity or even the work. Now, what, in summary, what I'm going to do is I'm going to double back and, and, and make the argument that I've been making br briefly, and then dive into the work proper uh, at that point in which the task is to, um, to find the element of the new or surprising, the emergent, in the, in the patient's production, the, the, the signals of, of, of what I venture to call the real. Um, and it, I'm going to, one of the reasons this is a difficult presentation, at least for me, is that, is that I've chosen to take a case example, a, a particular clinical experience, which is peculiarly uh, uh, obscure it's to me. But in which one can, I think, in that very obscurity, perhaps see more clearly, because of the obscurity, paradoxically, the nature of what it is we have to do, uh, what I think we have to do. And I will take us through my understanding, my very limited understanding of that critical phase of the work, uh, and then up to the point where the work begins to become more familiar which is the subject of the next uh, discussion, which is about uh, uh, painful and fruitless repetitions, the subject of which was the, uh, the term for which became, in, the, in our general literature, the concept of the repetition compulsion. But those painful repetitions, which, which bring people, I think, to a large measure, into our hands, <coughs> But I want to take us up to the point where that, where that becomes clear, or relatively clear, which, which God knows it isn't always at the start. <coughs> now, the, as, as you are probably tired of hearing me say, um, the starting point of this effort is, is a statement about the nature of the psychological. That is, it is, my claim is, and I think it's a substantial one, my claim is that, that the, it, is the, it is in the nature of the psychological to form perspectives. That is what we mean by the psychological. That is, it, the psychological refers to the psyche and, and, and the word about the psyche. That is to what we uh, elaborate in a view of life, an outlook, a perspective, um, which is unique to us and to our experience. And that, that act of forming a perspective contains within it, as I again have said so often, a, a, a curious property, um, which is the capacity of the subject, the subject which has the perspective, the capacity of the subject to take both itself and the world as an object. And that taking as an object is, an, is the essential element, it seems to me, of what a perspective is. That is, we have a way of seeing things. We have a way of naming things. It's a form of meaning-making of our individual uh, kind. Um, 
Now what this means in terms of our work uh, is hard to encompass adequately, hard to, to grip in a way that, that's because it sets such an extraordinary problem before us, and I feel it is the essential problem of psychotherapeutic work. That is, the fact that the psychological pertains to perspectives, to individual meanings, and taking as objects of the world, means that, that when we meet someone, we meet what is called a person or a situation. But, what in that person and situation we are able to see, to, to give meaning to, to conceptualize, sometimes even to see <coughs> or to feel, that is determined by what aspects of the object in front of us fall within our perspective, can be given meaning about, can be named, uh, can be vivified by the relationship we form with it. So that although it seems to us we see the person, although it seems to us we have grasped some individual, all in fact that we have grasped is that those coincidences of, of meaning, of particularity, that that particular individual is able to set off in our perspective. So much about anyone utterly escapes us, utterly escapes us. And what's worse, Many of the most superficial and unimportant aspects are the ones that our perspective is trained to perceive. So this extraordinary delimiting of our grasp of the other, this extraordinary distortion as well as delimiting of our grasp of the other, is, is it seems to me, the first fact of our work. <coughs> now, I, I don't mean to say that that is anything new to science. Because when the, the first scientist picked up, the, the first geological scientist picked up the first rock and looked at it, and all he could see was its uh, spiny uh, gray texture, whatever, or its weight. If, if that first geologist could today look at the way a, a true geologist sees a rock, I mean, it, it would be, yeah, he couldn't believe it, could he? Because it's been decades, even centuries, of study that reveals to us that our perception of that rock, you know, doesn't just leave out most of the story, it, it barely touches it. And, um, and so it is perhaps even more, although who's to make comparisons? As my mother used to say, comparisons are impolite. Right? Well, they're also uh, misleading. Who's to make a comparison between geology and psychology? But not only is that person to whom we are entrusted, you know, and who is entrusted to us, huh? to whom, to whom, in whom there is a really a relationship. Not it is not safe to say in the secular age a sacred one, but a very, very serious one. That person is opaque to us in large measure. Furthermore, compounding this, uh, this darkness is the fact that that person's viewpoint, how they see the world, is at an e even greater remove from us. However accurately we can describe their moods, their thoughts, their appearance, all the so-called mental status, etc., psychological, examinational aspects of our work. Now this brings, at this point, we introduce the concept of psychological reality. And as I have said a couple of times, that's a deliberate oxymoron. I mean, that is a deliberate internal contradiction. Because whatever is psychological reflects a point of view, which means that it cannot include, as I've just been saying, very much a reality. So I think when we speak of psychological reality, which I am, Lord knows, over and over doing, when we speak of that, I think we are speaking about, about subjectivity opening itself, limiting itself, knowing itself, and above all, knowing that those aspects of reality it may or may not catch.
comprise uh, you know, a very meager part of, of the, uh, the existing reality. Again, something that science has taught us is the case, hasn't it? How little even the most, even the broadest conceptions include. <coughs> now we have a, we, in this work, by definition, this psychotherapeutic work, we propose to take a therapeutic perspective. And so all through these remarks, there have been added on bit by bit notions of what that therapeutic perspective would consist, what aspects comprise a therapeutic perspective. And you recall that from the beginning of these remarks, I've made an analogy to, uh, to, uh, to what is now a commonplace of, of, of neuroscience. That is the idea that the cells interact with one another by depositing in the space between them their various secretions. Uh, this, this activates one of the ways in which the, the system of neuronal communication, interdigitation, is activated. Now, as I say, something very analogous happens between us in our therapeutic encounter because although we may be ignorant of the person, although we may see very little, least of all, of their point of view, nevertheless, we impact upon each other forcibly. So forcibly, in fact, that I've made the suggestion early on that, that the neglect of psychological anesthesia or analgesia in relationships is perhaps the, the, the clearest sign of the primitiveness of our work because nowhere else in the helping professions are you allowed <laughs> to step on people, so to speak, without at least giving them, you know, Novocaine or something to, to relieve the dangers of the invasion. But we proceed as if the impact of one person upon another is either benign, necessary, acceptable, but I think for the most part unnoticed, that is, within the therapeutic perspective, although in fact, if you turn yourself into a patient for a moment of even the most benign doctor, uh, you, uh, or the most benign therapist, you know how much danger there is in that to our, uh, to our shame, to our guilt, to, the, to the, our self-esteem, etc. So the, the way in which we impact upon each other, which is principally felt, is an emotional apprehension, this is something that calls up the notion of, of analgesia or, or anesthesia. But it also calls up a change in perspective, doesn't it? It asks of the therapist that the therapist rise above, well, a kind of out-of-body experience almost, rise above the interaction of the two neurons or the two collections of neurons to see it, to see it, as it were, as a whole, from above, so that when the person impacts upon us, we come to understand what that is. We come to learn and, and expect its effect on us. And that concept, of course, is, is, uh, is permanently written into our thought in the concept of counter-transference, which is the name for our awareness of the impact of the experience on us. It isn't an altogether good concept for this because, of course, it implies that, that all our responses are, are unreal or, or transferential in the sense of being carryovers from earlier life, which in part is true, of course, and often very, very true. But nevertheless, this responsiveness to the other is an intrinsic feature of all the work and can only be, it cannot be avoided. We would not want to avoid it because it was dead in the relationship but can only be perspectived, you might say, can only be seen from a little different angle, lest we become too embroiled or too furious or too frightened or whatever. <coughs> now the second feature that, that I wanted to give a lot of attention to in these discussions, the second feature of a therapeutic perspective is what I, what I have called pristine conscience, a, a poor term, but the one that appeals to me and, and, I, and I think I've chosen the term pristine conscience because I'm trying to elevate it, you know. I'm trying to dignify it. 
and be also because I think it needs an adjective, although pristine may not be an inspired <laughs> invention for it, but uh, it needs an adjective because conscience, of course, generally has meant uh, the, the, the voice of God or the voice of our parents or society or our established value. And I, I put in pristine conscience in keeping with the 20th century's interest in the problem of conscience, which is to the attempt, part of the 20th century's attempt, to cleanse the idea of conscience of church or state and to let it simply be the voice of ourselves, ourselves, the pristine, that's why I call it pristine conscience. This is an idea very, very strong in, in 20th century thought, of course, and of course often deplored by, by the um, guardians of church and state. Um, nevertheless, that is an idea deep to us, and it's embodied, it's embodied most centrally in our clinical work by the question we ask of ourselves and of the patients over and over again. It often becomes the central question of the work, and that question is, what's for you? What's for you? Right? And that is a reference back to what I call pristine conscience, a reference back to the interest of the patient and the pain of the patient, the failure of the patient, to establish what's for you. And again, I, I remarked in, in discussing this that um, this calls up a great deal of excitement in many quarters, in which it's seen as selfishness or narcissism or whatever. But it's a deeply embedded, embedded feature of what our work has come to represent. <coughs> Several times during these discussions, of course, as you recall, I have made a comparison with artistic conscience, and notably Cezanne's conscience, because perhaps his as much as anyone, I'm sure others as much, but his as much as anyone, um, was accompanied by a, a spoken interest. Um, and that, in my opinion, took its most dramatic form in his, in his uh, brave, some would say megalomanic, announcement that he did not want to paint a picture. He did not want to paint a picture. What he wanted to do was to do what nature did, make apples, make landscapes. And because he was part of nature, he said, why should I not be able to do it, you know? Now, from our point of view, from our therapeutic perspective, this presents itself immediately, immediately, as a line into what, what we have called the psychologically real. Because it says, when I see you, I do not simply want to form my picture of you, my perspective of you because that won't be enough. That will not, in all likelihood, be faithful to you. That will be like the failures of Cezanne, simply pictures of apples, cliches of apples, what he expects to see in apple, what I expect to see in the patient with such and such, right? Instead of who the person is, is. So that as Cezanne so proudly announces that he will be like nature and reveal the true apple and not the picture of the apple. So we, no less bravely and, and no less often scorned, also propose to say to ourselves and to, and to the patient and to the world really too, we want not our cliche of what a person is or should be, but we want the chance for that individual to emerge on their own, to come forward with the question a little bit at least answered, what's for me? Now in order for, in order of course for such a venture to get underway at all, it depends upon respect for the other, respect for the other. And uh, I, I use that word and I use it as everyone does, lightly, easily without, for the most part, knowing what I mean. Congratulating myself, for example, when I think I have exercised it, you know. 
like a like a like a blunderbuss, you know, being thankful it didn't kill a patient, you know, how respectful I was, says King Kong as he climbs up the the side of the Empire State Building. You know, it's um but we, we but we 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 are paying homage, you know, to an idea that we seldom exercise with any at least I seldom exercise any confidence. And yet that respect, that as it were, standing in awe, really, toward the other, because of our ignorance and because of the difficulty of the task, constitutes, I think, the word most deserving of, of, uh, of, of our attention is perhaps the watchword of, of, uh, of, um, of our work. Once upon a time, if you forgive me for an anecdote, once upon a time, uh, the... Um, powers that be decided that the names of the state hospitals should be changed and I at that time was working in something which called the Boston Psychopathic Hospital a wonderful name and quite accurate because Boston it was about Boston mostly psychopathic in those days was a synonym for um, for psychiatric psychiatric won out over psychopathic and psychopathic got delegated to the bad actors but in those days when 1912 when the place opened it was in fact the Boston Psychopathic Psychiatric Hospital, and it was a hospital. I suggested, <clears throat> to great hoots of laughter, uh, <clears throat> from because I had heard that there was a hospital in, in New Orleans called Our Lady of, of Immediate Succor, and uh, and since the Cardinal of Cardinal Cushing was a great friend of the then Commissioner of Mental Health, I thought that I had a chance. Little did I understand the workings of the world. <coughs> So I suggested that the mass metal be called Our Lady of Immediate Succor, <laughs> and that all the state, rest of the state hospital be called Our Ladies of Perpetual Succor. <laughs> As you can see by the results, it's got nowhere. But, but and instead, of course, what happened, what triumphed, was what, you know, so often triumphed, was that things got called exactly what they weren't, um, and which is a good idea, particularly if you're up to no good. The, um, they, so it was called the Massachusetts when it wasn't. It was restricted now to an area, even within Boston. Uh, mental health <laughs> certainly was about the opposite, right? And as for being a center, it wasn't clear to me what it was a center up, except often great confusion. But at that time, there was also a, 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 an absurd suggestion put out that we have a plaque over the hospital, which would indicate our mission. And there were naturally many facetious contestants for that uh, role, that which never materialized. Perhaps, thank God. Anyway, and many many people you know, wanted to to do what Dante did on the entrance to hell. You remember, abandon hope, or you enter here, which uh, which wasn't at all in keeping with the upbeat mood of the '60s, or or, or, or in this case, about the 1960s. And <clears throat> I suggested, however, that. <clears throat> Also, with no result, that I suggested that, that the thing over it be um, accept uncertainty or do not stay. Accept uncertainty or do not stay, which I think is a reasonably good. But in the back of our minds, you know, I think I would have preferred at this late date, but even then thought about it, that, uh, that we put in Latin so that no one would have to understand it. <laughs> that we put in Latin something like, let us respect, let us respect, you know. Well, so much for that plea. Now, in, in my remarks about a therapeutic perspective, beside the, these things I have just said about, about the, um, uh, the perspective on perspectives and the search for pristine conscience and respect, I mentioned that as the two perspectives, one therapeutic, hopefully collide, um, the, um, there inevitably comes into the mind of the therapist the concept of error or sickness or disease. This is, and, and I suggested that although this may be a very wise and often is a very wise reaction to situations, that more often than not, it simply represents, not simply, it represents the collision of perspectives, the falling down of our capacity to stay with the other person's point of view. And therefore we alienated by something from it, 
we, we use our favorite words for the experience of distancing, which are words like error or sickness or, or, um, or badness, even evil now, even evil. Um, within the therapeutic canon, the concept of evil, you, you know, has returned, especially in the study of the traumatic states. Therapists speak now of evil, which was long forbidden by, under the ther analytic uh, command, I think. But because of the appalling things that we see, the word evil is called up, because sickness and, and, and error won't do. And so people are driven to the, to the extremes of their em emotional responses, and they speak of evil. Now, you recall on, uh, on a number of occasions, I suggested that that um, a, 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 a anecdote from the literature of, of education to indicate uh, the pause we need to take at this moment of announcing or feeling error and sickness. And that was this simple story of the teaching of mathematics to children of a certain age who when asked why one, which is larger, one quarter or one third, very commonly, most commonly answer one quarter. And then when the teacher gets a perspective on this over the immediate perspective of error, the, the, the new perspective of seeing the impact of this on ourselves leads to the remark, well, why? Why would one quarter be bigger than one third? And then the child says something true, which is four is bigger than three. And we see the divergence suddenly in our perspective on this com complicated concept of fractions. The other day, uh, my neighbor, who's a, who uh, makes documentary films, dropped off a book that he had written based on his films about the uh, search throughout the whole world for examples of, of farming, farming in, a, in different, very different situations in the world, which had worked out well when the farmers' helpers hired by the United Nations and someone had entered and succeeded. He had earlier documented many occasions when people had come in and made matters much worse in farming communities by their efforts to help, and he became interested in what was the formula or formulas for helping successfully people of very different cultures, very different experiences, very different to agricultural situations, of course. And you won't, you won't be surprised although he was somewhat surprised, to find that he was, uh, that he was talking about respect. And above all, the discovery by often arrogant experts that the farmers of the so-called primitive farmers had in, were in fact extraordinarily acute students of the appalling situations under which they tried to grow their livelihood and that they had watched it many for many, many generations, the changing climates and land, topography, and it eked out of it often, extraordinary harvest from impossible situations. So, of course, you would say immediately, respect for that very, very hard-won, hard-starved knowledge, right, would be the beginning of help. And when indeed these few workers who succeeded in helping these farmers, when they succeeded, it proved to be that those were the people that had come in and learned what they already knew, and then could occasionally make a small adjustment which would add to the possibilities of success. Reading that, of course, I had no trouble, you know, feeding it into my own beliefs uh, and, and knowing how often, from my experience of clinical work, especially with the psychoses, people come in and, and sort of steamroller over the other person's point of view, trying to get it right, trying to adjust it, trying to change it, trying to fix it, only to leave behind the appalling wreckages we, we see all over our city streets today. While a careful study, obviously, of the perspective, the hard-won knowledge and details of the even the most primitive, we use that word primitive too, don't we? That primitive patient reveals an extraordinary knowledge of the world around them. And with that respect for that knowledge, then we can sometimes add a little bit here and there, which might make uh, 
make that psychological agriculture more successful. Well, so much for my reviewing what I've said already perhaps too often. But now let us imagine ourselves then just at this point where we have gotten beyond the, the insistence upon error and sickness, have worked back to respect for the individual, and are now looking for what will be an opening, an understanding, a sense of life perhaps in a, in a seemingly dead person psychologically. And that's what I wanted to now try to describe in one instance. And this is a patient I've talked to you about a little before, so that some of this will be familiar, but I hope to be able to make clearer what I don't think I have yet, um, what it was, what it was in this curious perspective that I thought I could begin to see. Now you remember this, this young woman, um, uh, this, this uh, able young woman, a very intelligent young woman, had a long history of psychological care going back to for her for a fourth or fifth year, many hospitalizations, many attempts at medication, from which which she had which she had occasionally, especially some of the one or two of the therapists she'd had had been helpful to her, uh, but on the whole the, the effort had never had a decisive effect, and she had kept herself going in a sense, but had fallen back over and over again into these long period, often long periods of demoralization, which were given various names, but usually with some of the gravest terms that we use in our vocabulary. Um, as I began to feel a little bit now and then, very tentatively, that I understood perhaps something, um, I began to see, began to sense that her perspective was like a pane of glass, which became clearer or more opaque, depending upon those times at which she felt herself vulnerable to the gaze of others. Now I'm asking you to imagine that, that this perspective we have on life is in fact like a piece of glass. We look through it. But as I've been saying, and as you know so well already, anyway, uh, it's a curious piece of glass we look through because it's very hard for the other person to look back. Very, very hard. And with most of us, we have made that impossible. <laughs> we are, don't like to be looked back into, right? Except in those rare moments of, of true friendship or of unguardedness, right? For the most part, we have a shutter that we click down around the, the scope we look through. She, however, did not feel in control of that shutter. And now this, this notion first came to me, very familiar as it turned out to be to her, but first came to me when she told me at, in our first five or six months of work that something was feeling better. And, and what it felt like was that the what was the expression she used? The barrier was getting thicker so that she could go out in the world and not feel that everyone could read her mind, see her, what she felt was her strangeness and emptiness, and that she could go about her business with relatively, un, with relatively unguarded, in relatively unguarded ways. Now, now, it wasn't hard to guess or difficult even for her to say that behind that changing glass, that opaquing and clarifying glass, was an experience of emptiness and despair and, and nothingness or, and strangeness that she felt she was exposing or enduring when she allowed herself to think about it. Now, that was behind the glass. Now, in front of the glass, something extraordinary happened and it happens with all of us, and we forget how extraordinary it is. But in front of the glass, this young woman was able to, to project onto a sort of dim embodiment of herself. And she didn't feel like it was really her, but a dim embodiment of herself. It was sort of her, 
those impostures, you might say, those postures, but impostures, because they didn't feel like her, those impostures which made it possible for her to walk around in the world looking as if, you know, she was one of them. Hmm? So that behind was this sense of emptiness and despair and strangeness. In between was this changing glass of, a, of varying opacity. And in front was this, what would, what would you call it? Like a marionette show? Was it one of those old devices that you'd throw, us, throw images on a screen from? Which were moving, however, images of what she had painfully learned was the way she could safely be in the world. Now, I, I imagine that for most of us, that process of learning how you can safely be is more happily learned. You know? And perhaps because it's more happily learned, it can be more solidly ours. Now that doesn't mean that that's a good idea. <laughs> we may be deceived into thinking we know who we are. Like Lacan, Lacan's subject in front of the mirror, realizing, this is me. <laughs> that's who I am, right? as if this grimacing figure with its special clothes and gestures constitutes a me. But anyway, that we, that we will all, to some extent, buy into, especially when it is not so bad to be that way. But for her, she said more and more, said more clearly, although never with great definiteness until much later. For her, however, that imb dim embodiment, as I've called it, on which the imposture ship could be projected, that never felt like her. And it, above all, felt utterly alienated from this strange, empty thing behind this glass. Now, that, now this is not the only illumination of perspective that, that she gave me, this generous person. It also became gradually evident, and then dramatically evident when it stopped, uh, it became gradually evident that this perspective, this glass, was in fact not just a, a, a small aperture, but was it like a globe. And it was lined and colored by religious injunctions and expressions. So it was as if she looked through, I, I would think of a stained glass window of a church, but that doesn't do justice to it. It was really, it was more girded and gridded and, and, uh, because it contained the rules and regulations of behavior, action, and belief. Furthermore, it had the curious property of, of interfering with something sent through it, like a gesture or a speech, and get it corrected into the right form. Uh, again, it's easy to imagine that this is the experience of all of us to some extent. But with her, it again had a dramatic coloring because it, it did not seem hers. It was, it was felt as imposed and correct and believed in, but somehow again alien from the living person, that, uh, the presumably living person, that was behind it. <clears throat> now, in the course of this work, oh, uh, uh, she began to stop eating. This had been a common, uh, a common uh, uh, compl uh, complaint. Not, it wasn't a complaint. She liked to stop eating, but it was a com common complaint by the, her caregivers. And um, um, and this had usually been greeted with the usual efforts to force feed her or persuade her or a hospital to do something about that. Although that was not the only thing that brought her to the hospital, but. <clears throat> It occurred to me in the course of what little I understood that that, that was the wrong idea. That, that was once again an imposition of correctness on this perspective grid. And I thought that she, I told her I thought she should not eat, really, until we could find a way to eat for herself rather than for them. That, that we wanted to make a life in which she, it was worth being fed as opposed to being force fed. And, um, and whether, I, whether because I said it with as much feeling as I had, or whether it was the right thing to say, or I think what's more likely, 
whether something had been happening in our relationship which made gave me an authority um, that made possible the collapse of this prior authority so that it so that what I said had a meaning which substituted in that perspective which I think is what happened and and you you probably forgotten but at the time I discussed this once before I mentioned that that that, that was not at the same time but sufficiently close in time to the extraordinary collapse of the, of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe. And people were speculating how that was possible. And it was common to read in the newspapers and to hear spoken the statement that, well, you know, when the people lose faith in the regime, the regime immediately collapses. That, that in fact, the regime is the people, a selected parts of the people. And that when those people cannot be believed anymore, it collapses. Now that I found that a surprising idea, and I still find it partly very, uh, very difficult because I am uh, faced by a machine gun <laughs> wielded by the boss. Um, the importance of my faith in the regime seems to me trivial. But anyway, that's a view, a viewpoint that was commonly said, and I thought to myself, well, maybe there's something to it. That maybe this. Rapid. It was quite rapid, the collapse of her God perspective. Maybe it had something to do with a shift in her loyalty, be that as it may. Now, when that perspective collapsed, she found herself rapidly, again so surprising to me, rapidly ushered into a world where she was free. And she found herself walking around the street, surprised at what she could see and notice, un, un, ungridded, ungirded by this system that she'd had before, and really, and, and quite light-spirited. And uh, it, was an, it was an extraordinary thing to hear about, and very hard for me to believe. And you wondered whether it was some kind of hysterical self-deception. Although this is a person in whom the capacity for self-deception I have found miss missing. You know, in order to deceive yourself, you have to have a very interesting type of self. It has to be able to deceive itself. <laughs> it has to be wonderfully arranged to be able to pull that off, to be able to really play a game in which the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. I mean, that, that requires some inner machinery of a kind that is well worth exploration. I can kid myself, you know, I can really kid myself. And that's the way most of us work. I know that's God knows the way I work, you know. The average sensible person, I don't really put myself in that class, but the average sensible person says, forget it. <laughs> you, tell them you tell them your troubles, and he says to you, okay, forget it. <laughs> you know? Think about it later. <laughs> And that's, that's called self-deception in one of its forms. And it's God knows it's the, it's the greatest discovery, you know, puts sliced bread and fire and wheels and all that stuff uh, way out. But, um, but that seemed not to be contained within maybe this fragile and, and, and almost liquid self that, that she had. So, so it seemed to me. So I didn't think she was willing. And even more supportive of the notion that she wasn't fooling me or anybody was that within a few weeks, that mood changed. And she began to notice that nothing meant anything anymore. <laughs> nothing meant anything anymore. And the old meanings were gone. And I thought very, very quickly of, you know, what Nietzsche proclaimed about the death of God and what it did, what it, what it left us, where it left us and what the secularists of the 20th century have told us we have to do now that the received meaning is gone. You know, we have to project ourselves out of the world. Well, that's all very easy to say. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, you know, m many of us would welcome back the, the almighty you know, the substitute. I have enough to do. I'm trying to make a living. And, you know. Anyway. But there she was, also trying to make a living um, and succeeding in it, <clears throat> but suddenly without any guidelines in this, pers this new, clean, but empty perspective that she was confronted with, or so it seemed to me. I, uh, I don't know what kind of interest you have in these matters, of course. No more than you know my, you hear my perspective. I, 
and happily they don't hear as much of yours. But, but when, when things like this uh, crop up, as they not uncommonly do in clinical work, I keep wondering, you know, what am I watching? What am I listening to? What am I learning? Is this, is this a disease? Is this an illness? Or, or is this the modern human predicament? brought to us in a particularly terrifying, frightening, demoralizing form simply because the person has really faced it and not kidded themselves the way I like to do. I don't know. And, uh, and as you know, that's, that, that, that announcement is by no means mine. I, I did not say that for the first time. That's uh, Periodically through 20th century studies of this kind, that viewpoint has come forward sometimes very forcibly, as in the, as in the work of, say, R.D. Lang. But it's not, it's not a foolish question, it seems to me, to ask. Well, here we were. Uh, now, suddenly, not well, fairly suddenly, entering a period where, where the, the old where the old structure seemed gone. And, and I want to say that, although I made this sound dramatic, this assertion by her that, that she no longer has God with her has been repeatedly made through the, the good two years that followed that period. This is not a transient thing. Sometimes she feels that something comes back, but it's never been the same as that. That's, that, that seems to me, as much, as much as one could say anything with confidence in this business, seems to me to be true, that it's gone. But what it left behind was only momentarily this good news, because the real entry, the, 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 the entry point was the entrance to a tunnel in which there seemed to be, uh, to be no meaning and great confusion. And even sometimes what was astounding to me was she would come in sometimes and say she couldn't see things. Now, this is a woman who walked around, did her business, paid her bills, and took, went to classes, even taught classes. Elizabeth Brin did those things, but she said that oftentimes she would look at the river and all she would see would be floating lines. Or it, and, and, and there would be many examples of that. And I wondered to myself whether what had happened was that the, the perspective was really clean now. It was like maybe like an infant looking out on William James's blooming, buzzing confusion because all the learned things had gone. But that's madness to say a thing like that. No one can believe that. The central nervous system can't clean itself up all of a sudden like that. It must keep those things. Well, obviously it did keep them because she went about her business, didn't she? She, you know, she was, she could identify things. She could get through the turnstile at the MTA, at the, at the, at the subway station, all the rest of it. She could do those things. But maybe there was a part of this organizing thing which flipped in and out and which sort of maybe somewhere in the nervous system turned on and off the accessibility of the familiar categories, and that maybe that was what sometimes happened. And that's, that's imaginable, that uh, what, what the remarkable Gerald Adel Edelman calls these gating and mapping procedures may sometimes be turned on and off. Incidentally, if you haven't seen um, Oliver Sacks, if you haven't seen uh, which I owe to uh, uh, to Faye Middleman having shown me this this the piece in the latest in one of the latest um, uh, New York Review of Books. Uh, Oliver Sacks is account of Edelman's latest book and, and of his previous books too. Uh, on on we, and I like Sacks's brave language very much. But he, he talks about the soul in the brain, you know, and it's, an, it's really his argument about how you get to the idea of soul through modern neuroscience, and, and greatly assisted by this extraordinary uh, Gerald Edelman, whom you may, you may remember, won the Nobel Prize for his work in immunology, and has introduced some of those immunological concepts very interestingly into, into the study of the brain. But I, I really recommend that, uh, that, um, that account, because Sachs, you know, Sachs has many very great gifts, I think. But one of them is that when he gets going on a piece of exposition, he he doesn't mince, he doesn't doesn't spoil you, he doesn't take you through easily. He gives you, I think, if I'm not, my judgment, it's a brilliant account of the, of the business, and, and difficult but very brilliant account. And, and another thing I love about Sachs is that is that he has played a part in this himself. You know, it's not been a big neuro 
physiological part, but it's been a clinical part of great interest. But the way in which he mentions his own contributions to this are a model of how you honor other people's work and still raise your hand when you have done something of your own. It's a, it's a, it's a nice thing. It shows a, a, a disposition, at least on paper, that's enviable. <coughs> But here it was. Here we were in this tunnel, I say, and um, and I wanted to I want to try to describe what that was like, and what I tried to do with what was, for all intents and purposes, obviously a chaotic psychological situation. Um, I I found myself sometimes, perhaps because of the weather as well, uh, comparing it with with watching a snowfall through a window and and doing what uh, Suzanne Langer used to call physiognomonic perception, that is trying to put yourself into the snowfall, uh, trying to think of yourself maybe as like a snowflake or something, watching it not just from a distance, but to try to get with its flowing and, and upping and downings and around. And it's a dizzying experience. You're, you Perhaps you recall that when Susan Langer wrote about this, it was in the context of trying to understand what had happened in the human organism, in the movement from, from ape creatures to human creatures. And, and, and you may remember that she, she made what was for me a very illuminating suggestion that, that when we say, when we stop being chimpanzees, and however that works, um, uh, we lost something very capable. For example, you can put a chimpanzee in the, in the middle of a whole bunch of junk and uh, standing here, you know, a lot of tables, chairs, all piled up on top of each other. And the chimpanzee will go right to the top. And by means of its long arms and its extraordinary sense of balance, will come right down again. Uh, anything happening. Now, you can't do that. But what you can do, she said, was you can imagine what it would be like to be up there <laughs> and then not go. <laughs> and that, that's what she called physiognomonic perception. And it's, it's an empathic gift. It's an imaginative gift that we have in place of some of our proprioceptive clumsiness. Well, that's what I was trying to do with my, with my snowfall in looking for a, a feeling like the feeling listening to her mumblings, it was mostly mumblings, uh, or her gestures and her movements, listening to those, uh, or watching them, as I was doing. Um, and I, would, I thought, as I imagine you would, or would do under similar circumstances, that this, that this person seemed to lack a center, or if you think in terms of William James's uh, uh, stream of consciousness, it was like a, a, a river without a riverbed. <laughs> without a guiding line to it, or if you think about intentionality, it was a person without intention, something of that. So that was the impression one had. Now, of course, I, in my confusion and, and puzzlement and fear, although by this time I was safe, much more comfortable with her, we had gone from a time when, when she would reject, hardly bared, bothered to reject anything I would say. I mean, she was polite, unfailingly polite to me. But I was, a, I was a spectral creature, a shadow man, no meaning that I could discern, uh, that, that she felt in me. We went from that to feeling that there was something real here uh, to, uh, in, the, in the work. But in, and in between, there was a kind of growing sense of uh, confidence won't do, but a sense that at least my intentions were good, and to, until again, uh, had, there was something like respect was being born uh, in in her relationship with me, and it was not just politeness. So that I would, when I ventured to say what I thought might be going on in this mumbling, you know, this gestures and things, um, as I say, she would it, it, not, at first nothing was meaningful. She would talk about, it. she would pick it up, and maybe then say something about something else, which didn't seem to me very relevant, but it may have been. Um, but the emptiness got clearer, the sense of difference and strangeness, the, uh, uh, the feeling that 
that she once had, that there was a presence that was dangerous to her, that was now gone, but without it she had no guidance. Um, the feeling that there were some safe objects, some trees particularly, some plants, the bark of our dog outside, and things of that kind. And in the course of, particularly in the course of, it seemed to me, of revealing more about the inner despair. And despair doesn't do justice to what was really a kind of sense of nothingness. Um, the tears would come. And that, that to me was, I suppose for me, the most promising moment. The first time that happened. Now, now she cries relatively easily. But the first time tears came because her, at a meeting I once had with her sisters and her together, they had all said, both sisters had said, she, they had never seen this, their sister cry. They'd never seen her tear. All their experience with it. So that seemed to me, that had, my emotional apprehension of that was reassuring in the sense it, it conveyed something that seemed to me hard to, hard not to greet, hopefully. Now in this confusion, in this confusion, at first I was only trying to sort of <laughs> look like I knew what I was doing, eh? you know? Uh, I gave that up uh, for the most part. Partly remembering what Carl Whitaker has, uh, you know, has recommended in the care of people that seem very crazy. And says, Don't be afraid to be crazier than they are, he says. Because you will find very often that if you are crazier, they get saner. And sometimes you can see that with their mothers. When the patient gets better, the mothers go crazier. So if you're willing to go crazy with the patient and not mind it, not mind it, not deny it, you can often find the patient letting up. And maybe the two of you can alternate on this. And then maybe join it. And maybe distance it eventually. That, uh, that inspired worker, Carl, I don't know whether you're familiar with some of his remarks of that kind, but they... They are, uh, they are so interesting, and I think very, very, very helpful. Now, I was, I was perfectly, uh, no, I say perfectly comfortable, ha <laughs> ha, I was relatively comfortable doing that, and I, and I could do that, and I think I, gra I think I gained with her gradually the capacity to, if, if not to enjoy, at least to be steady and comfortable in, um, in both my ignorance and, and my madness, if you like. But I was also looking in this for what you might call a sign of life. And at first I was stupid enough not to see the sign of life in the confusion itself. And, and I, I kept remembering something that my sister used to do to me when I was a little boy. Um, she would sometimes put her hand, put her hand in front of her, her chest like this and she'd wiggle her fingers. And, and I knew that that meant that I was lying and that she was aware of the fact that I was lying and she was always right. Um, it was, uh, at first I was a little embarrassed and it was kind of a game and I would do it back, but it, it was very interesting. She, she, and, and she was kindly about this and my sister, I don't recall my sister always being kindly, but in any case, she, she was kindly in this one because she would, she would not do it if she thought, I think this is my perception, that she would not do it if she thought my lie was useful in whatever family horrors might have been going on at the moment. So she would let, let me get away with it then, and maybe even lie a little herself, if it would straighten out some, some difficulties that might be going on. But when she thought that I was really doing it for my own personal benefit or to embarrass her or something, then of course I got a great, wonderful wiggle like that. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to be able to do. I wanted to make some kind of gesture that in a kindly way said, oh, now I see what you mean. I know what you're doing, that, but not that you're lying. Because I went, she says, this woman was not a liar. But now you're telling the truth. <laughs> now you're saying it the way it is. Hooray, you know. But I didn't find anything as clear as that. But I did become able, I did become able to welcome the, this chaos, as I say, to enjoy it. To, um, to feel that, in fact, what I had been puzzled, confused, and despairing of was, in fact, a kind of, maybe, was a kind of broth out of which things might grow or be cooked into a point of, of forthrightness and, and personal being. And that was the biggest, I think that was the biggest 
change for me, the, willing, the willingness to accept what was ostensibly crazy and, and, and impossible, and worst of all, despairful, and therefore very frightening to me, as perhaps, you know, the kind of the beginning of things, the, the, the uh, sort of the, the, uh, the cellular medium, you might say, of something, uh, something good. Now, as is characteristic of such confused broths, there are lots of different things in it. And, uh, and, and that was part of my problem, because there was a great deal of despair and a great deal of, of sometimes overt statements about how, how impossible it was, how hopeless it was. And then I said, on the other hand, these statements of despair were made increasingly forthrightly. <laughs> So I had, I had a double message there, didn't I? Here was someone saying, God damn it, life is not worth living. Not nearly like that, but you know. I mean, so that in a lively, forthright fashion, the person was saying, give up. <laughs> so, that, so I thought that that was good, but it's hard to respond to. I mean, should you congratulate them on their forthrightness, but maybe they'll think you're congratulating them on their despair. I, don't, I, I find that a hard one to, to handle. Now, all through this, now, there are, I'm making three claims, it seems to me, each one, of, each one of which may be more insane than the previous one. The first claim is that this mumbling confusion is a good thing, is the, as I say, the, the birthplace. Attitude. Oh, no, excuse me. The first thing is the, the broth is promising. The second thing is that in this broth, out of this thing might come a kind of forthright projection. In other words, in other words this, that maybe her pristine conscience would find the courage to search and find something of her own in this thing. And then the, and then the boldest claim of all, I think, is that maybe my patience with it and maybe my answering, you know, my, my enthusiasm, if you like, for certain aspects might be, you know, helpful in developing this. Now, now I'm saying something, you know, very familiar to our literature, aren't I? I mean, nothing right. But you remember when, when, um, <clears throat> when, um, you know, Winnicott speaks about the mother looking for spontaneous gestures, the child's own true self. That's, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. And you remember, he also says, the, the good enough mother, whatever awful expression is, uh, ought to be able to amplify some signals, ought to be able to support some signals. And, and if they're lucky and wise, they'll, they'll support something that's really the, the, the child's own thing. And that's the, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about. But I'm not doing it here, though, with, of course, with a child, although it may be harder there. And, and what makes this claim in this particular instance uh, more bolder, if you like, even than, than, uh, than Winnicott's, is that I'm talking about a condition which most people would say was a major psychosis. And um, so that that's, uh, with all the implications that someone's, you know, uh, gray matter is going to rot or something of that kind. But I, but I make that claim, and I, and I think it's it has been uh, somewhat supported. Now I'm getting to the end of my story, and it's, it's about time. Um, getting to the end of my story, and because what's happening, what's happening now as this material seems to collect, it, she begins to say things for the first time. Now we're now into the third year of this work. Um, she begins to say things about what actually happened to her. <laughs> you know, I mean, in fact, the fact that her father moved around a great deal when she was a kid, she just went from one school to another, and her sister, who was a, not identical, but a uh, two-egg twin, would enter into these new schools by being a successfully enthusiastic personality, joining the club, saying the right things, doing it. And, uh, and I, having met this person, I can believe it. Um, but my patient did the reverse. She would identify with the most outcasted other person in the class, and then, of course, collect on herself 
all the same opprobrium. So that from a very early time in her life, she was sort of a movable exile. The advantage of being an exile is that, of course, you can leave your last place without much regret. On the other hand, she had nothing to look forward to except more of the same. Uh, there was no triumphs to look back on, but only the, uh, the uh, abuse that she had experienced, along with her alliance with the, with the uh, scorned ones of this world. Well, these things began to emerge. There were more to it. It became evident that, that, she had, that she had been loved by people, and she had loved them too, but that anything like a full engagement with the relationships was, was frightening to her. And, the same, and it seemed to me, and here we're getting to the very end of this story and the beginning of the next one, is that what she experienced, what stopped her short, and now we're talking about something like a repetition compulsion, what stopped her short was that that she was very sympathetic with the, with the person she was with, deeply sympathetic with the person. With. On the other hand, on the other hand, she could not express any reservations, so she was unguarded. And she couldn't remain in the situation because she was really helpless and, you know, as I say, someone identified with their pain. So she had no way of protecting herself and no way of protecting herself from their pain. And you can again see the similarity to what it might have been like to be a young child in a classroom identifying with a, an outcast uh, other child. And she didn't see any way through that. And above all, she, she didn't want to lose her sympathy. On the other hand, she also could not express uh, her herself for fear of being hostile and like those other people who had persecuted her and her mates. Well, those are, that's a, that doesn't do much justice, I'm sure. But I learned something in the course of this that, that, uh, that made me feel like, oh boy, there's something, there's something more to be done. And there's, you know, some bright, I probably won't do it, but some bright person will tell me how to do it. Um, because here I am saying I have a hard time hearing. I, or in, when it comes like that, I can't see the spontaneous gestures very easily. I'm confused. So how do I know she's not making them? <laughs> how do I know that in fact all along she's been shouting out the reality of her world for me? And it isn't just confusion. The confusion is mine. It may not be so much hers. And that if I had better hearing, or better seeing, I could realize that. Maybe if I was more real myself, my emotional apprehension of her might be make it a great deal easier to pick up those signals and know them. Well, what I'd learned, I thought what I'd learned, was respect for her turgid, I thought turgid medium, um, a capacity to catch now and then some emerging signs of life and modesty about how much I was probably missing. And then I would, something would happen that would be despairful at first to me, and then I got used to it. She would withdraw again. Uh, for example, she had a gesture she would make. She would sit down and she would put her hands, her, her hands underneath her buttocks like this, and she would sit in a very determined way. And it was it was new. I'd never seen her do that. I've been watching her for a long time. I'd never seen her do that. And then she had a gesture she would make with her right hand that was something new. And I, and I looked at them and I would smile and I want to cheer and I would cheer sometimes when she'd do something like that because I thought those were kind of like spontaneous gestures. But then she'd fall back and I wouldn't see anything for quite a long time that, that struck me as like that. And then I said to myself, be patient, be patient. You know, it's like respiration. You breathe in, you breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out. And, and don't think that retreating is a bad idea. Maybe she wants to take a rest. It doesn't matter. Let her breathe. You know. And uh, But in my enthusiasm, in my eagerness, of course, sometimes that was very hard for me to do. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs>